Hello, this is Aaron Maller from Parallax, and this is just a quick video to go over the graph that we were putting together uh, to help migrate data in between what we're calling the unit data floor objects and the model groups themselves. So in this case, you're looking at uh, the unit cloud, and just for testing the graph, um, I've actually copied several of the units multiple times, but obviously in the unit cloud, there would only be one instance of the unit here. In this particular case, I've placed the unit data floor, but I've also made sure that this particular model group has more than one unit data floor so that we're checking for multi-floor uh, units like uh, multiple story units. And then I've also placed um, some uh, unit data floors in the other units that are sitting in the cloud temporarily just so that we have something to look at. In this particular case, for unit B1, there's only one instance of the group, but I, paste, I placed five of the floors in there again uh, just for evaluating. Actually, it looks like I did place multiples of those as well. Uh, now, just to show you, if we go back to the unit sheet, uh, of course, we've got a schedule here now. This is the revamped model group version of the schedule. So it's reporting uh, the type of the model group itself. You can fill in any information about accessibility and configuration that you want because they're all now just type properties of the model group itself. So you can fill in any information here that you want. Obviously, it's going to populate into the schedule. So uh, the two heavy lifts that we had is number one, getting the count uh, to read from the live building model instead of from the unit cloud. Obviously we have that handled now because we can schedule all of the model group instances. Right now I'm just scheduling them from the unit cloud just for this demo because there's no building model. Uh, but then we have the dynamo graph, which is simply going to say inside this particular unit group, there are three floors. I'll tally the area of the floors. And if I run the graph briefly, you'll see that now the area for the entire unit is filled in, but we're getting around the problem of it multiplying that into 2200 roughly. If we were to go look at the full unit schedule for everything that we have right now, you'll see here that of course S1 is the one that we just filled in and there's the square footage. Uh, and it has also filled in the square footage for all of the other units. Several of them are still sitting at zero, and that's because I didn't put the unit data floors in all of the unit cloud groups while we were doing this demo. So as you can see, it's all working. Um, I played it from Dynamo, but you could play it from Dynamo Player if you wanted to. And I'll give you a quick run through on what's actually in the graph. First, uh, we'll use Monocle to just make sure I didn't accidentally uh, slip in any uh, third-party packages, and I intentionally did not. So this is all out-of-the-box Dynamo nodes, so you won't have to do any package management. So there are two tracks to the graph. There's the upper track and the bottom track, and so we'll go through both of these. The upper track is going to start out grabbing the category of model groups and saying collect all instances of the category model groups. Now keep in mind this means that we'll have multiple instances of unit S1 selected as an example. You'll see here there are 15 groups selected but then what we're going to do is we're going to get the name of the groups and you'll see here that there is all 15 but then we're going to say only give us the unique items in that list. And the reason why is we made the parameters type parameters in the model groups. That makes sense so that as more units are copied through the building, the data is all there. But we don't want to edit four groups for unit S1 and push parameters into the type properties of the group because we'll just be redundantly setting the exact same parameters. So we're gonna use a little workaround where we select all of the instances of the groups, get their names, list only the unique names, and then we're going to find all the indices or all the positions in the list where each particular one is used. So you'll see here, unit S1 is at position 0, 7, 10, and 11 inside this list. 0, 7, 10, and 11. Then what we're going to do is we're going to say from each of these sublists, just grab the first one, which is always index 0. What we're doing here is we're basically saying, since we're going to edit a type parameter, it doesn't matter which one in the list we grab, so let's just grab the first one in every list. That works out well because some of them only have one item in the list. So we'll grab one of each, we'll put them into their own list here, 
and you'll see that now we basically have a smaller list of eight groups instead of 15. From there, we'll go back through, we'll collect all of their names. You'll see that there is a group in here that is not related to the units at all, so we're going to say, look simply for the word unit and filter out all of the other groups. One thing to be aware of is that does mean that we're going to need to have some way to isolate overall units from things like unit bathrooms. So we'll probably want to get people not to name their groups unit bathrooms, or we'll have to change this piece of text that we're looking for here. At this point though, we have the groups that we care about. Here is all seven of them. Now we're going to say get all of the items that are inside the group for each of the seven groups. And you'll see if you collapse this, that all seven groups are listed here. Once we have all 289 of those elements, we're gonna say, get the name of each element and go looking for unit data in the object name. If there is a floor that's named unit data, of course, that will show up as a true. So then we filter each of those lists so that we only get the items that are unit data floors. You'll see here that there are three unit data floors in the first list. That's because you'll remember in group S1, we drew the unit data floor and then we threw two additional unit data floors off to the side just to simulate what would happen on a multi-level unit. From there, we're going to feed those unit data floors into a get parameter value by name and we're gonna query their areas. So if we go in, you'll see here, that is the actual unit data floor in S1, followed by the two floors that I copied outside the group. Now, we don't wanna set up any situation where we're hard coding the number of unit data floors that may be in a group, and that's why I wanted to test it, one of them with five floors, some of them with one, and some of them with three. What we're gonna do here is simply tell Dynamo, get the sum of whatever's in the list. So if there's five, it will count five, if there's three, it will count three. If there's one, it will count one. Then, all the way back here was the original group items, and you'll see that that bypasses the whole train, and we're going to take the group item, and we're gonna say get the item type, which just means get the group type, because we made the area group parameter a type parameter. And we're gonna set that parameter based on the sum value that came out, and that's where, of course, if you look at this value here, you'll see the 586.1 and the 586.1. Now, that's basically all that we had to do, but one other thing that we're doing, just for um, expediency or ease of use in documenting, is you'll notice that here I've actually selected an instance of the unit data floor, and we've now written unit S1 into the instance properties. Now when we were writing to the group properties, we were intentionally writing to the type properties so that we didn't have to go uh, force interact with every model group that was in the project. But in this particular case, we don't want to have to create different floor types for every unit because that's just an extra ton of data that we've got to carry around inside Revit. So what we did is we created a whole second parallel track that's running at the bottom of the graph. And what we're doing here is we're simply spinning off the moment we have all of the model groups. So once we have all 15 of the model group instances, we're coming down here. And we're saying, instead of only getting the unique ones, get all of the group members for all of the model groups in the project. You'll see here that there's currently 1,716 items. We're doing the same thing where we're filtering down to just unit data floors. And so you'll see here, uh, that there's now a larger list of unit data floors present um, because now we're getting all of the instances instead of just the ones in the first type. And all we're doing is we're writing to the instance parameter of those unit data floors with the name of the model group. The reason that we're doing this is, as we discussed on some of our calls, if later on in your workflow you decide you'd like to make some diagrammatic plans where you're going to want to only show the building outline and the unit data floors. Now you can use tags on the individual floor objects because they, ha they have a data field that's named the same thing as the model group that they're sitting in. So that's the whole graph. Uh, it runs pretty quick. 
Uh, I don't imagine it's going to take very long to run, uh, even in a fully populated building, but obviously it won't run quite as fast as it did here. And what we'll switch over for the final implementation is obviously right now this schedule that's on the sheet. Uh, we have it filtered to only looking down at the unit cloud, but we'll just have it uh, filtered um, above the unit cloud level. So this is going to wipe out the schedule right now because nothing is modeled up there. And then the unit schedule for all will change that filter to do the same thing. The only major difference will be that now, of course, the accessibility and the configuration data is going to be in the model group schedule instead of the floor schedule. So everything's working as we expected. Doesn't require any custom nodes. So uh, we'll package this up and we'll get the final parameters loaded into the template so that you can check it out in the next version.